Once again, uh, a warm welcome to everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. So let me introduce our guest, Professor Robin Geimer. AM is a Deputy Director of the Centre for Eye Research in Australia, and it's Head of Macular Research. Robin's also Professor of Ophthalmology at Melbourne University and a Senior Retinal Specialist at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital. She's a clinician scientist who leads a team of researchers primarily investigating age-related macular degeneration, or AMD. In the 2018 Queen's Birthday Honours List, Robin Geimer was named a member in the General Division. I need your hearing aid. Recognised for her significant service to medicine in the field of ophthalmology, particularly age-related macular degeneration, as a clinician, academic and researcher. And as you all have read, Robin's current research interests relate to investigating new strategies for treating early stages of AMD. Robin, we're delighted that you've accepted our invitation to share some of your insights and experience with us this evening. Thanks, Jeffrey. Great to be here and fabulous to see so many people managing to log on and uh, uh, be here tonight. So um, it's very, I'm used to talking to people of a certain age because they're my patients that I see every day in the clinics. So more than happy to have questions at the end however simple or, or easy that they might may be to address. So we're going to talk about age-related macular degeneration, but first of all, I thought I would tell you a little bit about myself and how I ended up where I am. Um, so we'll just move the slide forward. So I come from Shepparton, uh, this is where I grew up uh, and spent my early childhood. My parents were both school teachers but my mother probably was the main influence and certainly was very keen on getting her children a, a good education. And she got an OAM uh, 2004 for particularly her role in um, education, but also she was very much involved in the arts and um, uh, was a, was a um, city councillor uh, in Shepherd and spent all her life pretty much around that area. So she uh, was very keen that uh, both my brother and I should go to Melbourne uh, for our senior education. And so I went to Presbyterian Ladies College in Burwood. I was a boarder there uh, from 75 to 78. And then I did medicine at the Royal Melbourne Hospital for six years, sorry, Melbourne Uni for six years, and then uh, was a, a young doctor at the Royal Melbourne Hospital um, for a couple of years, and then did a PhD at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute which was just next door. Um, and then after that, I joined the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital for training to be an ophthalmologist. That was a, a four year training period then. And that, at the end of that, you end up being what's called a general ophthalmologist. But I actually had plans to go back to Shepparton as a general ophthalmologist, but wanted to do some extra training. So I actually went to London and went to Moorfields Eye Hospital, which is probably the most famous eye hospital um, in the world. But uh, at Moorfields, I spent two years there and really it was then that I realized this particular retinal diseases really had no treatments and yet were very common. And so it was then that I made my decision that perhaps I should not go back to Shepparton and, and go back to a big uh, city hospital where I could do some research. So I went back to Melbourne and at the time, 1997, uh, we just started what we call the Centre for Eye Research Australia or CIRA. And it grew out of the University of Melbourne Department of Ophthalmology. So at the moment, uh, we have a, over 100 full-time equivalent researchers at the Centre for Eye Research Australia. And that takes into account about 200 individual people. And we now rank about fourth in the world by whatever metric you want to use in terms of the output from this independent research institute. We still remain the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Melbourne. Uh, and we're located there on the top floors of the Eye and Ear Hospital. So that's where I spend uh, most of my week. So currently I am Deputy Director of the Centre for Eye Research Australia, but I head my particular unit that I started 25 years ago called the Macular Research Unit. And I'm also a professor of surgery in ophthalmology at the University of Melbourne. 
I also work at the Iron Ear Hospital as a senior consultant uh, in the what's called the medical retinal area. So looking after retinal diseases that don't require operations. I have a small private practice across the road in Victoria Parade in front of St Vincent's. And I also have a family and two children that are just uh, one's finished uni and one's uh, in her final year of a, a master's. And this year was the 25th year that I've finished my training and, and come back uh, and started that uh, research unit. And this is just a picture of the current team of researchers that uh, work with me every day to try and um, benefit patients by understanding macular degeneration. So let's then just turn now to the eye and vision and just uh, spend a couple of minutes trying to understand um, how the eye works and what can go wrong. So this is a recent paper showing um, on your right a graph of how common vision impairment is around the world. And I've put a red circle around Australia and the sort of the Western westernized countries showing you that we have less vision impairment than perhaps developing countries, but we still have a, a proportion and the different colors are the darker it is, the, the more profound the vision loss. So most of our problems in our society are not blind people, but mildly or moderately visually impaired. And what are the sort of things that can cause that? Well, the commonest thing, interestingly enough, worldwide is lack of a pair of glasses. So simple to fix, but indeed we haven't fixed that. So what's called a refractive error. So people needing glasses and that would certainly improve their visual impairment. But if we look at other conditions that are perhaps so easily addressed, we have, uh, if just looking down at the pictures, problems with the eyelashes that particularly affects our Aboriginal or Indigenous population and leads to blindness because it clouds that front window called the cornea. You can get scars on the cornea from accidents or burns. Perhaps one you've all heard about is cataracts where the lens in the eye goes cloudy, requiring probably the most common operation in Australia to take that out and put a plastic lens in its place. And then when we start to look at the back of the eye, diabetes is a big issue, particularly with our uh, population whose perhaps diet is not as good as it should be. Um, and so that affects the retina and causes blindness. Glaucoma is one which is very common in our older populations. Uh, and then down the bottom is age-related macular degeneration or AMD. Um, so they are sort of common occurrences that we see uh, at the hospital. So if we turn our attention to the retina. If you think of the eye like a camera, the retina is really like the film in the camera. And so that picture there showing the a cross section of the eye, the light has to go through all the structures to get back to the back of the eye where it's focused uh, on the retina. And then from there, the signals are taken back to your brain. In fact, the retina you can consider as part of, part of your brain. It's an outpouching of the brain. But we're going to interest ourselves in the retina, so the film in the camera. And so at the centre of the retina is something called the macula. And in the centre of that is something called the fovea. So macular degeneration affects this central part, which you can see there in my black circle on the right. You get As you get older, in people with macular degeneration, they develop a lot of debris or deposit right in the middle, that central foveal area is what you need to read. It's the one that gives you fine vision. So recognizing faces, reading books, driving, you need that very center part. And that's what can be affected in age-related macular degeneration. So in terms of Australia and what causes blindness, and by blindness, we mean legal blindness, which is defined as not being able to see that top letter when you go get your eyes checked at the optometrist. If you can't see the top letters with your best eye, you would be called legally blind. And here is sort of a breakdown a few years ago now, but this is pretty much still standard as the, the causes of poor vision in our society. And you can see that the vast majority, so virtually half, are due to this AMD. Cataracts, glaucoma, diabetes make up some of the rest. Again, in the world, it's very common. And this really is just showing you that as you get older, 
the incidence of the early stages and the late stages of macular degeneration exponentially increase. So you can see there down the bottom, you know, after 75 going upwards, the number of people that have macular degeneration increases exponentially with age. Some people would argue that if we all lived long enough, we would all get macular degeneration. And this is showing the, what's uh, anticipated to happen uh, in the next uh, 20 or so years. And what we can see here is in Asia, because the population in Asia is aging considerably, it's going to contribute significantly to the burden of people with AMD. And so in 2020, it was estimated about 2 million, 200 million people had AMD, and that's thought to going to increase to 288 million by 2040. So it is a problem with the aging of our societies that we're going to get more of this disease. And so as I alluded to, it is the most common cause of severe irreversible vision loss in our community and people over 50. I hesitate to suggest that includes all of us uh, on this call tonight. Uh, and so one in seven people over 50 will have some signs of macular degeneration. And so that accounts for 1.4 million people in Australia. Um, and there's 9 million people over 50. And so again, this number will increase as our population ages. The proportion of people who have what's called the late stage, the one that's vision threatening, the one that's going to cause us trouble, is about 1 or 2% of people over 50. So less, but still significant, equaling about 100 to 180,000 people with this quite significant um, uh, trouble with central vision. So even though it's very common, there was a study done recently just to find out what the, pop the regular population knew about this disease. And you can see on the right, the never heard of the disease, and we've got cataract, glaucoma, AMD, and diabetes. So if we just look at AMD, about one in five people have never heard of this disease, which is the commonest cause of poor vision in our, our community. And then another 28, so 50% of the population either hadn't heard of it or had heard the name but had no idea what it was. Looking at diabetes and knowing that diabetes can also affect your vision, that bottom line is, is very worrying that uh, you, you, you may have never have heard of the fact that people with diabetes have trouble with their vision. And that's, that's a bit of a concern given that we have good treatments for diabetic eye disease. So just to understand what we're going to talk about tonight, then I wanted to show you this. This is a picture that sort of divides AMD up into various stages. And on the left, we have the, what we call the early stages. So you don't have any symptoms. You don't know you have a problem. But when you go to the optometrist, they may say you've got some aging changes in the back of your eye. And what they mean is you've got these early collections of these fatty yellow deposits right in the middle, as we discussed before. And they give you a risk of running into trouble. It's sort of like finding blood pressure that gives you a risk of, say, a heart attack or a stroke. You haven't had the heart attack or stroke, but you've got the high blood pressure. So similarly, nothing's happened, but one in seven of us will have some of these features in the back of their eyes when they're over 50. And the risk is that they can go on to what's called late AMD, of which there are two types. Dry and wet is how we describe them to the lay audience, but the dry one is where cells basically die. And maybe you can see in this top picture on your right, there's this, this pale sort of C-shaped um, worm sort of shaped area where the retina is just missing. You can actually see the white bit of the eye around the back because the, the retina has died away. And in the bottom one, the wet one, it's wet because there is blood vessels bleeding in the back of the eye. And the wet one can strike, you know, in, at any time. There's no prediction of when it is. And very quickly, you can go from seeing perfectly well to having very poor vision unless something is done. And so the natural history of the disease is that you end up with either on the right, this big solid area that's sort of missing or this big scar from the wet macular degeneration. And you can imagine thinking of the retina like a film in the camera, there's these big splodges or a bit cut out um, of that central retina. And so you can imagine if this is the bit that tries to read, drive, recognize faces, it's going to be very badly affected. 
And this used to be what happened. So when I was training in England, this was there was no treatments. And so people would end up with both eyes usually because it used once it affects one eye, it's usually two eyes affected. Uh, you get these large scars in the back of your eyes. So 25 years ago, many people didn't do retinal training because there was it was very dismal. There wasn't much that you could do. And people with this disease will first compl first thing they'll notice. Uh, if they have the bleeding form, the wet form, is distortion of straight lines. So this is trying to uh, show you what that might look like um, with the eye near hospital. And then if nothing's done and the bleeding continues, you get this blob in your vision, which is uh, not ideal. And things that people complain about that influence their quality of life is the reading becomes very difficult or impossible no longer able to drive, which reduces independence, can't recognize grandchildren's faces, don't recognize friends in the street. Usually you're walking around, getting around, living by yourself vision is fine because it's only affecting that tiny bit in the middle. The rest of the eye works perfectly well. So you can walk around, you can live in your own house. Uh, it's just those finer details uh, which are missing. And so this, I use this to, to show that it actually wasn't very trendy to, to look and uh, research AMD early on because it was pretty dismal. And so it wasn't really a good pickup line uh, socially. But now it's very, um, very uh, in demand as a specialty because we're really making big differences now in how we treat these patients. So if we look now at the causes of AMD, what do we know causes it? Well, there are things called non-modifiable, some things you cannot do anything about. And one, unfortunately, is our age. So the older you get, the more common this is, and we really can't do anything about that. And the other is our parents, our genetics. And AMD is regarded as a very um, significantly uh, complex chronic disease where your genes make a big difference. So we know 52 little variations in your genes that will give you a greater or a lesser, lesser risk of this disease. So those two things, age and your genetics, we really can't alter and they really are the main players in causing this disease. What are things that you could modify? Well, we know smoking is a risk factor. Uh, a diet that's rich in dark green leafy vegetables may be protective. We know if you're overweight or you lack exercise, that's probably not good. And so the really just general lifestyle advice is as far as we've got currently in knowing how to perhaps reduce someone's risk. But once again, once you've got the wrong genes and you're the wrong age, there's not much that you can do to reduce the risk of actually getting it, except perhaps from not smoking. So let's just turn our attention now to the earlier stages of the disease. This is where there's no symptoms. It may be picked up just when you go for your regular eye test. And so if it is picked up, we give people a piece of paper with some lines on it. So even though we put people on the moon, we're still for the last 60 years handing out a piece of paper with lines to ask people to monitor their vision. We have improved. We have put it on the iPhone so you can... Uh, get a copy from your phone, but it's pretty poor that in the early stages of the disease, we don't know how at the moment to stop people progressing. We don't know how to stop people getting those early signs, but what we can do is try to pick up progression to the later stages by asking people to take one of these pieces of paper home, put them on, on the fridge or behind the toilet door and once a week monitor vision. And we do that because if something happens to one eye, you may not notice because the other eye is still good. So the idea of this piece of paper is you must cover one eye at a time and then look at the grid with your glasses on because what you're looking for is distortion of these straight lines and you have to do it one eye at a time. So there's nothing special about the piece of paper other than to prompt you to look at one eye and then the other. And so this is what we're expecting. People do it every week for years and then suddenly one day they see the lines become distorted or, or missing. That really is a, an urgent phone call to an eye doctor or at least an opt optometrist to get checked out to make sure you're not having bleeding in the back of your eye. 
So now let's look at the wet macular degeneration. That's the one where is, there is the bleeding in the back of the eye. And this is a bit of a, a cartoon looking at the, the retina. And on the left, it's normal. So we have this blood supply underneath the retina. Very important. And it's got to give oxygen and nutrients to all the retinal layers above it. And as you get older, and particularly if you have macular degeneration, you get this buildup of uh, fatty, lipidy deposits. And you can imagine that that is not good for getting oxygen and nutrients through to the retina. And so for whatever reason, this is the underlying problem in AMD, is how do you get oxygen and nutrients, vitamins that are required to the retina, and in return, how do you get waste material out if it's all clogged up with this stuff uh, that's sitting in the way of getting to and from the blood supply. So that is our current understanding what the, the problem is, why it happens is still to be determined. And so here is a depiction of that wet AMD where the vessels that should stay underneath, they shouldn't invade the retina. But in the situation where the retina is lacking oxygen, there are signals that tell the blood vessels to grow and help try to help salvage this bad situation. But unfortunately, by growing into the retina, they destroy the retina. So they leak, they're not well formed, they're faulty, they're not supposed to be there. And that's where the damage happens. And so fortunately, as we've developed um, our treatments, we've also uh, developed the ability to image the back of the eye almost to the level of the histology. And so this is called an OCT machine. Many of you may have had an image when you go to the optometrist because many optometrists have this machine now. And you can see very beautifully the 10 layers of the retina. The dip in the middle is that fovea, that very central uh, area important for reading vision. And then down the bottom is the blood supply. Uh, and so that's a very uh, wonderful way of seeing the health of the retina. And here is the depiction on the top of those early deposits, those fatty deposits. You can hopefully see a, like a, a wave in that retina. So uh, you can see that they could block completely the oxygen and nutrients going from the blood up into the retina. And I put there a histological section so you can see we're in a living eye, we can pretty much see what, what you could see in a pathological specimen. And down the bottom is that eye with the blood. You can see that this is not looking good. There's this huge amount of blood underneath the retina between it and its blood supply. And the retina, uh, um, the blood is very toxic to the retina in and of itself. So we used to very occasionally being able to laser a little blood vessel that was leaking here. We're aiming to avoid the dead center, which is the little white spot. And very occasionally, if you caught the bleeding blood vessel while it was small, you could successfully burn it. But this really happened very rarely. Uh, and that was really our only treatment um, for a very long time. And then came this advance in the 2000s where you could give a dye that would better concentrate the laser's light to the abnormal blood vessel, trying to save the normal tissue around it. Uh, and it was called photodynamic therapy. And it really did not work very well, perhaps a small step forward. So it wasn't until uh, the early 2000s that we started to experiment with sticking a needle into the eye with drugs that aim to stop the blood vessels from bleeding. And this really has revolutionized the treatment, although it sounds terrible and it's not pleasant, uh, it really has uh, made a huge difference. And so here, for example, we can see a spot of blood in the retina uh, in that color photo on the left. And here is that scan and you can see clearly it's not normal. There's like fluid and this sort of tissue that shouldn't be there. And then after treatment, all the fluid has gone away We've got a little scar to the side of dead center. Uh, this would be a good response to these injections that you get in, into your eye. And so the aim of the treatment for wet AMD is to try to get rid of all this fluid that is in the retina as a result of that big blood vessel that's causing that, that hump down the bottom. And the aim is to get something looking like the bottom photo where all the fluid goes away. Uh, and you're left with the blood vessel still there, but it's not leaking. 
And so this, uh, these drugs called anti-VEGF drugs or intravitreal injections, um, which have to go in, unfortunately, regularly, um, every month or two or three for a very long time, if not forever. But they really have reduced the rate of legal blindness by more than 50%. So they became available to the general population in 2006. Uh, and so since then, the rate of legal blindness has really plummeted around the world um, from this disease. So fantastic. And in Australia, we spend an awful lot of money um, on um, uh, these drugs. So $665 million was spent uh, on eye injections, not all for AMD. Uh, about 50% would be for, for AMD. The rest, diabetes or other uh, blood vessel diseases in the rest. And about half a million scripts are written every year. Uh, and so the, it, this drug is on the PBS, which means the government subsidises uh, the use of this drug. And so we have several. Uh, we started in 2006 with a drug called Lucentis. And then 10 years ago was the next advance with something called ILEA. And this year, imminently, any week, now we're going to get the third uh, drug that looks promising, um, which acts slightly differently to the first two. So we may get even more um, benefit from this new drug. So it's been approved by the TGA, but we're still just waiting for it to get on the PBS listing. And so that will be yet another possible advance in treating this disease. So let's move now on to the dry one. This is the ones where there isn't that blood vessel response and so the cells just die. And so I call this to my patients like moth-eaten holes that happen in, in the vision and that's called the dry macular degeneration. And when you look in, um, it's a bit hard to see the beginnings and the ends uh, of where the holes are, but we now have again so improved imaging. So with this particular scan, the black is where the cells are missing, the black is where there's no vision, and the white bit is where you can still see. And maybe you can appreciate in the black and white one that dead center, we still have the central vision hanging in there to the last, and that's often the case. So if you did have a treatment that could just stop that, those black holes from growing, then that would be a great advance. But currently we have no proven treatment for this, this disease. Um, and when you look at the OCT scan, you can hopefully appreciate that in the middle there, there's a bit missing. So the cells, those bottom layers of the retina have just died. And so the light from the imaging goes straight through into the blood vessel layer. That's why you can see that quite white band. And so that's um, what the appearance of the uh, cells lost. But on the uh, what's called autofluorescent image, the black and white image here, it's the same patient seen three years in a row, and um, that middle bit is still okay. It's not doesn't have those holes, so the vision is still perfect. But you would be very concerned because you can see that the holes are growing and growing closer to that middle bit. And this is very typical of the dry form of AMD. It's not as dramatic as the wet form but we have no way of stopping this progression. However, right now we've had um, a lot of activity trying to find a drug that slows down the progression of the disease. And we in, have in our hands the first one that might actually be approved as a treatment. It's got a terribly long name called Pegcetacoplan. And it doesn't stop the growth. So the gray line there is the growth of those holes if you just give a placebo or a, a sham injection. And the blue and the orange are if you give this injection every month or every other month into the eye, you can slow down the growth of those holes. So it doesn't improve vision, it doesn't stop it in its tracks, but at least this is a first step towards slowing down vision loss from this very common disease. And so I can hear you say, well, why don't you try and stop getting there in the first place? Surely, is there nothing that we can do that you could intervene when you've identified someone with the early stages like the blood pressure? Can, is there nothing equivalent to like a, a blood pressure tablet to stop the stroke or heart attack? Is there nothing you can do to stop that progression? And that's really where we've been particularly interested in, in looking. How, how to get, stop you getting there in the first place. And this really has been quite a long journey, a 25 year 
journey for me um, because we started this when I was that fellow over at Moorfields in London. So in the 1970s, when people were using lasers to laser diabetic eyes with what's called a thermal laser that burns the retina, it was as noted serendipitously that the drusen disappeared, those deposits in the back of the eye disappeared. It was not intended that we were treating diabetes. And so in the 1990s, when I was uh, a fellow at Moorfields, we were using the regular laser in the clinic that was there for the diabetics to see whether we could clear up this deposit, which we think is the, you know, the underlying problem. If we could get rid of that deposit between the blood supply and the retina, then, then maybe that would be helping the disease. And so here's a paper I wrote in 1997, so 25 years ago, looking at laser in people with high risk earlier stages trying to stop progression. Unfortunately, because it was a thermal laser, it burned the retina, there was a lot of inflammation. And whilst our study did not show this, other studies around the world were worried that we were causing um, the problem we were trying to stop, which was the bleeding in the back of the eye. Because you can imagine if you burn bits of the retina, you'll get inflammation and that might encourage blood vessels to come right to the area that you don't want them to. So pretty much the laser went back on the shelf for this and, and it really was... Um, thought that this was sort of dead in the water as a treatment. However, um, when I returned to Australia, there is a laser company in South Australia that makes very good lasers. They have a great reputation for retinal lasers. They were called Alexa, now changed their name to Nova Eye. But they were, had a particular laser that might be useful to give us the good effects that we were looking for, getting rid of the debris, but not the bad effects which were the uh, inflammation. So what they have is what's called a nanosecond laser. So a laser that is so short, it does not heat up the tissues. So for example, here I've tried to de depict the regular laser in the clinic would, if you think about the circumference of the earth, the equivalent of this new laser is a one meter uh, ruler. So, so short, a nanosecond as opposed to a, a, a 0.1 of a second. So tiny in its uh, time that it hits the retina. And in terms of the energy delivered, similarly, uh, a regular laser would be four Empire State Buildings worth of energy. And this is just the height of a, a person. So a very gentle, what's called a sub-threshold laser. But it's got enough time to do uh, what it's set out to do to try and improve the retina. And here is a, a, the very first pilot study we did and hopefully you can appreciate there, uh, this is a map of the drusen down the bottom. You can see all these big uh, lumps and clumps. And then after the, the laser, hopefully you can appreciate that much of that deposit uh, was removed. And we were able to um, get somebody who was at the eye near hospital who needed to have their eye removed because they had very aggressive cancer to their lid. This happens once or twice a year, not very commonly. And this lady allowed me to laser her eye that was about to be removed so that we could have a look at the histology uh, of what we had done with the laser. And you can see on these beautiful pictures on the, the uh, right, um, on the top is a typical thermal laser. It causes damage to those beautiful layers of the retina. Whereas down the bottom is this very short nanosecond laser and the, the retina is beautifully intact in the area that I've lasered and does no damage to the, the tissue that needs to respond to the light. So this was very encouraging. And uh, if you took out the, the layer that I was aiming for, it's called the retinal pigment epithelium. And you can see on your left a very beautiful section where the cells look very healthy. And then on the right is where I lasered this lady five days before she lost her eye and a month before she lost her eye. So the hole is down the bottom where it says five days old, I've created this sort of hole in this layer of cells, which is really important. And you might say, well, why would you do that? You need these cells. But what it does is it encourages the remaining cells to divide and, and renew. So they get what's called daughter cells. So fresh cells that can now respond as a young person's cell rather than an older person's cell. So the idea is that you rejuvenate this very important layer that is thought to be very much implicated in, in the cause of AMD.
So the laser was looking quite promising. And so we, we ran a very large, random, what's called a randomized clinical trial, where we used this laser to try and slow the progression of the disease. And what we found was um, interesting results, which we presented uh, widely. This, this is showing the audience in the, when I first presented it in Europe and then at uh, late breaking news in America. So it was very uh, topical because really is the first time ever that uh, anyone's been able to perhaps slow down, um, not everybody, but uh, the majority of people with that early stage disease. So we're in the middle of trying to validate that first study. You have to always do another study. Uh, now we, we're trying to run an a international study, primarily in Europe, uh, to validate those results. And if, if we were able to, then, you know, fantastic, we have a, a treatment where no one else uh, has managed to do that. And so this company that makes the laser in South Australia, so it's a you know it's Australian company, they've put out um, press releases and to the stock market that um, they're planning to to run this study, uh, that they've got all their sites uh, um, uh, that have uh, said yes that they'll be involved. So there's a lot of interest uh, around the world to try and be part of these studies. So the moment we're trying to get more money to try and be able to complete that study because you can imagine you've got to treat a lot of people to prove that uh, people aren't progressing as quickly uh, in one arm of the study as the other. And so this is my final slide basically saying that AMD is common. Um, so good that you now a full bottle on it and you know all about it. Um, we've got improving treatments for the wet form. We're about to probably get a treatment for the dry form. But there's still a lot to do uh, with the disease, still lots of research to do. But this is really uh, to let you know that Australia really does lead the way. Here is a, one um, uh, a website you can look up experts in this disease around the world. And I was just pointing out that my team here in terms of all AMD, wet AMD, dry AMD and the early AMD, we, we sort of lead the world or very close to it in our research. So. We're in a good place um, to be able to impact this disease going forward, and I look forward to doing that. And now I will stop uh, talking and sharing my screen and look forward to any questions. Thank you very much. Oh, and here's my team. Sorry, this is my team again that I thank for all the work that they do. Oh, and I'll leave you with this. Getting older has its advantages. No one wants to borrow your clothes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Robin. I could hear the excitement in your voice when you were talking about the, the, the breakthrough and finding out the, the difference that it made with that very short exposure to the laser, laser treatment. Yes. Um, so it wasn't quite as straightforward. So overall, there really wasn't much difference. But what we did was we divided them into those that um, were not quite as badly affected as, as others. And in the vast majority, the three quarters of the group that were slightly, had less profound changes, we did a very good job. And in those that had really quite sick, that layer of cells was perhaps too sick, we probably didn't make any difference. So it's now we have to just look at the ones where we found it to be beneficial. And we slowed down the, the progression about fourfold. So quite a, quite a significant slowing um, of that disease. So we only hope that we can reproduce that. Uh, Terry, you're the first one to ask a question. Uh, I, I look at this chart daily because my uh, uh, ophthalmologist asked me to uh, to do it because he, he suspected the uh, macular degenerative. But I've been doing this for about three years now and I, I still haven't had any change in in the lines or, or the dot in the middle. Um, so uh, is, uh, can it be very slow in, in taking yeah. up? I'm so um, 86, by the way. Yeah. So you raise a very good point, And that's part of the problem with only having a piece of paper is that people are doing it every week for 10 years and nothing's happening. And they're saying, well, why am I bothering? But the point is, you hope not to be able to find a change. Because if you do find a change, it means that you've progressed to, well, we worry about the wet. It may be the wet or the dry. But usually profound change in that grid would imply that we're very worried that you have moved to the wet and thus need to start treatment. So 
the problem is if you don't test, we won't know and you won't know, which mm -hmm. is strange that you can't pick it up. You would think that you would know because you can't see out of one eye, but if the other eye is fine, it's amazing how many people don't know that they don't see out of one eye. And so the whole point is to pick up any change early. And so we ask you to monitor your own mm -hmm. vision um, because we have a treatment now. And so there's a point because you need to come in and have those treatments. And so, yes, you will be doing it for 10, 20, 30 years, and you're hoping that it doesn't change. And so I've been interested to try and what's called gamify with an app because people don't do it after three months, they give up. <laughs> so you really have to make it engaging and mm -hmm. compelling and, in fact, get people you know hooked onto doing that. And so mm -hmm. there's a whole field of medicine that's talking about gamifying apps, particularly for children monitoring their diabetes, say, uh, to make it much more interesting because you say you're doing it and nothing's happening. But that's why you're doing it and, and continue to do it. Well, mine's on the fridge and so i open the fridge every day <laughs> excellent yeah yeah so the the, mo the most important point is just to cover one eye at a yeah, time one eye so, yeah. Yeah. if you lose the the piece of paper it does not matter you just look at a tiles or a venetian blinds you're looking for distortion in in the line right. thank you i'm 93 and i have a wet amd which i have monthly injections and about the only thing I can do to help myself, um, apart from the injections, is probably diet. You don't seem to hold out much hope for the effectiveness of the diet. I dutifully eat my green vegetables, like Popeye's spinach, etc. But um, do you think, would it be worthwhile considering um, some kind of dietary supplements? Hmm. So most of those... Um risk factors and the dietary supplements and your spinach are designed to try and stop you getting to where you've got so when you've got there there really is no no added value in other than you know for general health you you've you, it's all over really you the whole point was trying to stop you getting there with with whatever we had and at the moment it's dark green leafy vegetables corn um egg yolk um but really, your age and your genetics is is the main um, risk factors. And so, um, you know, by all means, eat green vegetables, but it's not going to make any difference to your wet macular degeneration. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone's just said that dad has one one of each. Yes, so you can have wet and dry. Some people get a bit confused, you know, how can, and in, in fact, one eye can be dry and then go wet. So you can imagine cells are dying and then it manages to bleed or vice versa it's bleeding the bleeding stopped but we haven't addressed the underlying problem mm. and thus the cells still die so that's the main problem we currently have is that the injections will stop the wet but they haven't addressed that underlying problem of why were they there in the first place and so the, down the track people will still lose vision from cells dying and so even though we've got good treatments that stop that really profound, sudden loss of vision, we don't know how to stop, even with the wet one, when we've got the injections from down the track, still losing vision from the dry form. Thanks very much. That's been a great presentation. Uh, can I just ask about the new injection that's coming out as to when it's likely to be available, if you can indicate that, uh, when the tests will be complete and so on? Um, and what sort of difference you expect it to make in treatment? Will it reduce the um, frequency, et cetera? Mm -hmm. So the new one for wet AMD is called Ferizumab or Vibismo, and it's been TGA approved, and any week, actually, it will go on the PBS. So any week we will have this new drug. Um, so that's exciting. And the thing that's different about this is it has... It's a, it's a drug with two actions. One is what's called the anti-VEGF or the anti-blood vessel action. And one is aiming to perhaps reduce inflammation uh, and stabilize the blood vessel better. And so whilst the company is saying that it will maybe increase the distance between the injections, we don't know that for sure. But what we hope it will do is reduce the risk of the scarring and the cells dying. So that's that's where it might actually um, uh, have its its true benefit. 
So yes, the, the marketing is that it lasts longer, but actually in their trials, they did not do a fair comparison to the, the other, other drug because they had to, so the way we use this drug is what's called treat and extend. So we try to extend the distance between the injections. So they allowed that in the new drug, but they didn't allow that in the comparator because they had to use it as the label described in their trial, which was to use it every eight weeks. But in the clinic, you can, you can extend even the current drugs very often, way past monthly injections. And so we don't really know if there's going to be more people that can get out to every three or four months. There may be a few more, but it won't, won't be a dramatic change. But I think the real benefit may came, come in that slightly longer term benefit of stopping scarring and, and cell death because it has two actions rather than just one. And not, so it has been used in America since February and there have not been any recognized side effects. So the last new drug we had, everyone was excited about, but when it got used in the real world, it actually caused you know, some very rarely, but some profound vision loss due to inflammation. And so we're all a bit hesitant uh, to start a new thing because the old ones have been around for like 10 or more years. So it may well be that clinicians might not jump straight into the new one, but our benefit is, is that the Americans have had it since February and used you know, many thousands of doses and we've not seen that problem. So I think we can be fairly sure that, that we, we won't have unexpected surprises with bad side effects. I'm probably fortunate that I'm still at the stage where my regular OCT tests come up and say, yes, come back in a couple of years and we'll have another look. Um, but I'm always fascinated by the technology. Are there still developments happening in that technology or is it, how long has it been at its current level? Mm. Of so this is the OCT scan. Um, so the, the next big advance after just being able to scan the retina is what's called OCT angiography. So you can actually see the flow of blood vessels in the back of your eye without having to put dye in your so traditionally we've done what's called fluorescein angiography where you put a yellow dye in your arm and take pictures of the back of your eye like a cardiac angiogram um and glenn is here will, is the expert in all these things but um yes so we used to have to put dye in people's arms and then look at the blood flow and find where it's leaky now without dye with an, a, a different sort of feature on the OCT, you can actually look at the flow, which has opened up a whole new area of trying to understand uh, if is this disease actually due to poor blood flow to the back of the eye? Is that the, the first problem? Is this like a cardiovascular disease of the eye? Is it that the, the blood flow in that bottom bit just uh, diminishes as you get older um, and thus doesn't take away the debris that accumulates? And, and is that the, the pro primary problem? Um, so that was one big advance. And now, each time they get better in terms of their, um, their resolution. So we're hoping to be able to see rods and cones, so the photoreceptors, so to actually see the individual ones. And there are some machines that, you know, in research can do that, but you sort of have to have a, a beautiful eye without a cataract and you've got to be able to sit very still. So it's not ideal at the moment for regular patients. So yes, there's always ad advances, um, um, and even our own uh, Centre for Virus Research Australia has what's called a hyperspectral camera where in one photo you get many tens of different wavelengths because the signal coming back, uh, depending on the health of the eye and how much oxygen's in the eye will be different in these uh, different wavelengths and uh, can pick up things like Alzheimer's disease early in the eye, we, we think, because of the deposits remembering that the retina is really part of the brain. And so, yes, there's still a lot, a lot we can learn from different images. I was wondering uh, when you're expecting the laser treatment to be available. So we're still in the, the trials. So the, the hope is that the trial will be next year. So it'll take, you know, three, four years to, to prove its benefit. You can actually, you know, there are people that have bought the laser that, are, that will do it for you now, but it's certainly not a proven treatment and I would only use it in, inside a, a, of a trial. Um, so yeah, a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I see there's a question about are the injections likely to be ongoing? So the aim is to try and get out to about three or four months between injections if you can. Not everyone can get out to that far, but um, that's, you know, many people can. 
and it depends a little bit on understanding that that the end point of what you're aiming to achieve to know to see how many people you can get out some people do not stop the injections they go on for forever i i do give people a chance of stopping if they can get out to four months between injections and and there's no sign of it coming back if their other eyes is not terribly affected and if they're not on blood thinners if you're on blood thinners and you have a blood vessel and it bleeds it'll it'll bleed a lot so um i I do give people a chance of stopping and there is about 10, 20% of people that don't need them again. Uh, but you can imagine we haven't cured why they were there in the first place. So the potential is that they will come back. Um, but I do think it's worth giving everyone one chance of stopping. And then if it comes back, then, then you know maybe you've got to give three or four injections a year, which is not nearly as bad as monthly injections, which would be 12 a year. And maybe with this new treatment, we'll get more people out to that three to four monthly interval. Robin, um, thank you for that. As a retired medico, I'm absolutely staggered at the advances <laughs> since the time of my retirement and congratulations. Um, you pointed out that these uh, drugs are very expensive, but on the other hand, there must be huge cost benefits as well as uh, Quality, quality of life benefits. Have you actually, uh, someone actually done some sort of cost benefit analysis of how this all works? Yeah, you make a good point. They are expensive, but of course we're, we're saving people from being on blind pensions, from being dependent. Um, you know, it's, it's in an age group that perhaps may have stopped working, but some of them still working. Um, so yes, that's why the PBS was happy to put these all on on their you know free list is because there clearly is a, a benefit to stopping people losing their vision, uh, and in terms of quality of life, clear, clearly important. I don't have off the top of my head, um, you know what that that cost benefit was, but um, the drugs when they first came out was about two thousand dollars a treatment, and so very originally they weren't on the PBS, and so people had to pay for their first three, and then the company paid for the rest. And then fortunately, Australia is perhaps one of the few countries where it is actually free. And so Australia does much better than elsewhere, particularly America, for example, in, in our outcomes, because we don't have to necessarily consider the cost of the treatment. So um, our, our, um, our results uh, lead the world because we're so lucky and fortunate enough that at least the, the cost of the drug is um, covered. These days it's probably not because there's a lot of bargaining with because there's competition now uh, there's a lot of bargaining and so it doesn't cost that much uh, not to the two thousand dollars but it's certainly you know it is the the drug with the highest cost on the PBS these anti Thank you. Thank you. But we do use them for diabetes as well and again they've revolutionized our ability to try and save vision and that that population is much younger uh, and so we do keep people working. And just, for, you know, I, because there are patients around who have experienced vision loss before there was treatment, so they're, you know, they're now getting on, but they've got one eye that had the natural history. And to be able to keep that other eye functioning into their 90s, you just, you know that you have that life of that person has been significantly enhanced by these treatments for their last decade, you know, 15 years of their life. But so... So that those people who can really um, appreciate the, the benefit because they see what the natural history was. Now, yeah. when you treat both one eye and then the other eye, people are perhaps disappointed that you haven't kept it like perfect. Um, because as we said, we still trickle on to a bit of dry and a bit of um, fibrosis or scarring. So it's not always 6-6 six, six vision that you end up with. Um, and so people are somewhat disappointed, but the, in terms of the fa uh, natural history, it, it is still highly significantly better. You, you mentioned that the cause uh, is actual uh, bleeding taking place. Uh, and I know that uh, friends of mine taking blood thinners, they, they have a lot of bleeding going into the tissues of the body if they knock themselves or mm -hmm. um, uh, yep. have an accident. And I'm um, just wondering if, if that taking that drug for other reasons mm. uh, may have a, any influence on AMD. Mm. It's a very good question. Uh, and so we don't believe that uh, taking like aspirin, simply aspirin that thins mm -hmm. the blood, um, causes wet AMD. But if you have wet AMD and you bleed, you will bleed more 
on aspirin. Right. And so we would love people not to be on aspirin, but usually you're on aspirin for a good good reason. You don't want to have a stroke or a heart attack or you've got an arrhythmia. So mm -hmm. we don't tell people to stop their aspirin if they're on it for a good reason. But there was a, a bit of a trend you know, 10, 15 years ago to put all old people on aspirin. And so yes. that's stopped now, but particularly for mm. reasons like this, that's not a good idea. And there's a very large study being done in uh, Melbourne called the Esprit study, looking at putting healthy elderly people on aspirin to see whether it uh, improves their lifelong um, quality of life and, and, and their longevity. And actually it found no difference. There was no benefit uh, in stopping mm. cancers or or putting healthy old people on drug. And we've been involved in that looking at AMD and we haven't found um, big bleeds in people. There was no obvious difference between those on aspirin or not. Okay. But if you are, this is one instance where I wouldn't stop the, the treatment if you were on aspirin because I wouldn't want you to have a big bleed and I've stopped treatment, um, having done such a good job to, to you know get the vision good. Um, yeah. And then there is a question of whether taking aspirin might actually slow the progression of the disease. So that's actually why we were involved in that study because aspirin is an anti-inflammatory. It has lots of other actions other than just thinning the blood. And so there was a thought that maybe it could slow down the progression. And we're looking at that now to see whether that, that is possible. Robin, you can see that there's been a, a quite a, a lot of response and a number of questions there in a whole lot of different areas. So. Thank you to those who asked questions and thank you very much to you for sharing some of that with us. <clears throat> Clearly, it's a, a topic that is particularly relevant, as we were saying earlier on, to this particular age group uh, and uh, to actually hear about what's happening, some of the things that have made a real significant difference to the lives of people and is going to continue to make differences to the lives of people is uh, very reassuring and, uh, and helpful to us. So we wish you well as you continue and with your team uh, mm. in the researches that uh, you're doing on behalf of all of us. Mm. No, pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for everyone listening and dialing in. It was great.